All right. Hi, folks. Uh, welcome to Red Reviews slash the Skeptical Leftist Podcast. Um, this is some old bonus content that I'm editing and putting out for viewers or listeners now. Um, I guess, in a way, it's just extra content that you're getting um, that maybe you wouldn't have gotten <clears throat> if you weren't going to be a patron. Patrons get this stuff all included in one package with the main episode. There's usually a pregame, the main show, and then there's a postgame. Uh, and sometimes me and Justin talk for half an hour before we start recording. And sometimes we talk for like an hour and a half after we're done. So we <laughs> we spend a lot of time just just talking about various subjects and and you know kind of going through things and sometimes it's shop talk sometimes it's politics sometimes it's you know uh, getting to know theory a little bit differently um this is an old one uh so me and justin were still kind of new to recording together we had done i think like i say this is red reviews number six bonus content so we had done six episodes together uh, we were still getting into our groove. We, I thought, I think we were doing pretty good, but not nearly as where we are now. I, I think we're a lot more proficient, I guess. If, uh, if you, like, I wouldn't say professional because we're still pretty casual. We're pretty, uh, I guess, relaxed. We're not in a formal setting in any way, but, but I find, uh, even, even compared to the formality of the, the main show that we usually do, this kind of bonus content is much, much more casual. Yeah, the point is, this is old content. I hope you enjoy it. I hope this finds you well. Um, if anything's out of date, just keep in mind that this is from 2021. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's it. It's three years old content, but I find a lot of our discussions still resonates, at least to me. There's still, you know... Uh, some of the, the same stuff is going on, maybe maybe even a little bit more intensely, maybe even a little bit worse. But uh, yeah, it still is what it is. And uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody being here. Thank you for watching or listening. I hope this finds you well, and I hope that you enjoy it. So on with the show. Uh, this is where I always go back where, you know, Marx's famous quote, right? The, the whole... Um... You know, uh, the philosophers have hitherto only under interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. And that's true. Yeah. That's true, right? We do want to change it. But you kind of kind of interpret it first. Like, yeah. you kind of have to know. Right. Um, yeah, I mean. I think it's easy to get hung up in what past thinkers have said as well. Yep. Like, there, there's got to be a balance somewhere, right? Where you can go, okay, I've learned from what they, they're saying. And now I'm developing my own views on it and we're going to try and do something in society <laughs> exactly exactly so that I, I totally agree and that was part of the impetus behind the essay i wrote on lenin was you know he wrote these two essays about religion that i found kind of fascinating and i went okay well how would we how would we apply his insights today and so i kind of wrote this essay with thinking about you know because it's part of a longer term project that I want to do. I have this dream of writing a book for zero books, the, the publisher of Mark Fisher That's cool. um, of a book called a book called towards the left secular humanism. And, and it's this idea of it's a critique of the atheist movement, which by the way, I listened to a past episode you did with, I think a guy named Jeremiah. Oh yeah. Jeremiah, Jeremiah trigger. Uh, yes. And about like the state of the atheist, that episode was excellent. I like wrote down some of his sources. I was like, cause that goes into what I'm discussing because, you know, he's totally right. Which is that like, you know, my experience with the atheist is very akin to Isaac Asimov's experience with the, uh, with Mensa, which is that I met some nice people in it, but in general, the whole thing itself is just reactionary right-wing trash. And I went out of it. <laughs> um, and, uh, the thing I think I was very bothered by was he mentioned something about how, oh, it was something about the atheist community of Austin where like they didn't make a statement about something. And I think it might've been like trans rights or something. And they said nothing. And I was like, guys, you, you know, the biggest thing I find with like, what I find interesting is the people who all they do is like debate religion all day long. 
be think of themselves as atheists. I'm like, guys, like if that's all you're thinking about all the time, <laughs> then you're just you're just as sort of up your own ass and metaphysical and idealistic as right. the religious people you're going after. Yeah. You gotta and, have you gotta have what you're doing in materialistic <laughs> yes yes <laughs> Roots, like. <laughs> I've, been, I've been meaning to ask you this because you know so did you grow up religious uh, i when i not originally but then my parents my father and my stepmother quit drinking when i was a teenager oh, and okay. they became like born again christians so then it, okay. it was pretty hardcore for like three or four years before when i was a teenager so my whole life until I was a teenager, it was almost nothing. And then all of a sudden it was just plopped on me <laughs> and I had to go to church every yeah. week and tithe and ever all this bullshit. And then I was like an adult. So I, or I was 17. So I like, basically I moved out of my parents' house and I quit school and I was like, you know what? Fuck all this. <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Cause I, you know, I didn't grow up religious at all. You know, religion really didn't mean anything to me. I, and, and to this day, religion really more than anything else has been more of like an intellectual exercise. I'm fascinated by like right. what religions are, why people believe in them, how do they develop over time? Like I'm very fascinated by them. Um, and I attribute a lot of that to, um, <laughs> it's funny. I mean, they're truly some of my favorite books, but it, I don't know if I would consider it like a guilty pleasure or not. But the book that really left a huge impact on me when I was younger was the Da Vinci Code. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, and I was very fascinated by this idea that Jesus Christ was a human who had a relationship with a woman and had children, and that his bloodline continued. There's something fascinating about that to me, and that started the whole thing. That's how I got interested in religion in general was as just like, oh my God, people believe that Jesus had kids. That's weird. Let me look into that. <laughs> so like right. I, and, and so like I started reading like the stuff that Dan Brown read to write the book, like Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Right. And some of it's like conspiracy theory, but some of, of it's kind of interesting in this idea that like, because I, I don't know about you, I can't speak for you, but I think the idea of Jesus being a real guy who had sex and had kids and that the bloodline still might exist is far more interesting to me than him never existing. Yeah. That oh, yeah. I don't, that I don't buy. Like, I just don't buy that Jesus didn't exist. I well, know there's some good arguments for it, but like, I just don't, I don't buy it. I think that like most historians who deal in that are like, yep. uh, think that that's kind of an absurd thing to think. Yeah. <laughs> like, of yeah. course, of course, like there's, they, they draw whatever, I don't know their evidentiary, uh, lines, but they have evidence that they believe that says that Jesus existed. And, yes. you know, you can leave your whatever to whether or not he was some kind of God person or whatever, but he yep. was clearly a person who existed and was influential. Right. Yes. <laughs> and if he wasn't one person, he was sort of an amalgam of many different people. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and so like that whole conversation to me was fascinating. And that's how I got interested in learning about religion was just this idea that like, that like Jesus got some and like right. there's somebody today who might be related to Christ. Like that's kind of interesting to me. Um, and still is, I'm still fat. I'm actually rereading the Da Vinci Code right now. Oh, nice. and, uh, and, <laughs> I love it. I love those books. I love the interaction of like history and thriller. They're very fun. Cause like yeah. when you, when you read this kind of shit all the time, which I love, don't get me wrong. You need a you palate this, cleanser, right? You need a palate cleanser <laughs> and they're totally that. Yeah. So yeah, I, I find that stuff super interesting and it's kind of, but yeah, I never grew up religious either. And I, the reason I ask is because I, I don't want to say, I don't, I'm hesitant to say this cause I don't want to be mean. <laughs> But I think there's a contingent of the atheist movement who are are as, zealot, as zealous and and sometimes intolerant as the oh, for evangelicals. Sure. Yeah. And I think it's because they were former evangelicals. Yeah, I could see that. And so and again, this is not any disrespect to people. I'm not saying they're not thinking for themselves. What I what I'm mainly saying is that a lot of the sort of tendencies within them you know emotionally or interpersonally or intellectually it's really hard to shake the baggage off yeah. and so 
you know, it's kind of like how people trade in booze for Jesus, right? I think sometimes you can trade in Jesus for atheism and become as much of a zealot. Yep. Now, I'm not going to do the thing and say that they're just as bad as like <laughs> ISIS or whatever. Right, well, of course point, not. But Because that's silliness. Also, it's completely ahistorical and amaterial, immaterial, right? So, but I do think it's important to understand, like, there's a reason why organized atheism kind of has, I think, the flavor that it does. It's because a lot of these people used to be former evangelicals. Yeah. And a lot of them are people whose politics are still trash. Yeah. Like Robert Price is a good example of this. Oh, he's yeah. a fucking a fucking Trumper, right? Yeah. Or um and you guys I think talked about in that episode that James Lindsay asshole, which I don't know that much oh, about. He's he's awful. He's just all terrible. I know <laughs> all I know is that it was either it was either Vic Berger or the Chapo guys shared a video of him like fucking around with like a tomahawk. And it was the funniest fucking thing I've ever seen where it's like, you know, you know, that kind of guy, you know, the neck yeah. beard, fedora, my lady kind of guy. Like I've got my sword, and I'm gonna, like, wield <laughs> yeah. the sword, but I'm like a tubby white dude. And I'm like, and he's like, he's like doing these kinds of fucking moves. And it reminds me of like star Wars kid. Do you ever remember? Do you remember star Wars? Oh, kid? Yeah. Yeah. So it's very star Wars kid where he's like flopping it around and he's doing this kind of shit. <laughs> it's so funny. It's so funny. I laughed my ass off. All I know is that he pals around with that dipshit Peter Bogosian. Yep. Yep. And they're all obsessed that area. With, yeah. They're obsessed with the culture war and debunking like anything that is, really? you know, anti, they, they hate anti-racism because they think it's racist. They, they, hate any social justice movement because they really, really, really want to say the N word. <laughs> you know, I hate, to, I hate to say this, but it's like something, what's going on with you psychologically that you just feel compelled to say the N word, man. I don't know. Like what is wrong with you? Yeah. Like, like I don't understand that kind of shit. Now look, we on the left, like we have a critique of identity politics. Yes. And I was talking about this with my buddy Nick the other day, but here's our critique. Our critique is not that we don't agree with it. It's that it doesn't go far enough. Right. That the, that the problem with identity politics in the mainstream is that it completely cuts out class. Yeah. It cuts out material politics. It cuts out any understanding of class conceptions and, and the idea of working people. Right. Because that's the thing, right, is that like work, the working class has become this like cultural thing where people right. think of like some like beer bellied mid fifties white asshole coming out of a fucking like coal mine with like a, like a, like with like a lunch pail. Like that's what people think of. Whereas when I hear working class, I think of like the Latina single mom who works three jobs in California right. to barely keep a studio apartment above her head. Like yeah. that's what I think of. Right. And so it's so funny. These people are so against culture war, but like, that's all they fucking do. Yeah. That's and right. it's like, You've kind of become the very thing that you you hate. And the reason they're like that is because they don't have Marxism. What happens, <laughs> yeah. what happens when you don't, or anarchism or, or whatever, like yeah. having left politics. This is what happens when you don't have a materialist conception of politics is that it becomes a sort of culture bullshit. Yeah. You know, which, and yeah. Again, I like you can draw a line from the neoliberal project to the culture war that we have now because yeah. because of the individualization of everything and because of yep. the uh focus on you know superficial things rather than the class like class solidarity yep <laughs> this is the big trouble i have when people and we talked about this i think the last one of the conversations we had where i said this is the thing that frustrates me when people say oh well it's systemic racism and I agree with that. There is systemic racism. Yeah. But then they never go on to name what the system is. <laughs> and, or, or they'll say structural, or they'll say structure. These problems are structural. Okay. Yes. What's the structure? And then they're kind of like, blah, 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 blah. You, you, they don't know. And I have to go in, and I just want to go over there and go, it's, it's capitalism. capitalism. <laughs> it's capitalism. <laughs> That's the structure. That's why it's the way it is. Yep. Like, because then you can go, oh, this all makes sense now. Yeah, it's like, right. yeah. It reminds me of this great um, DVD that Michael Perenni did 15 years ago. And, and uh, you know, he was like explaining things to people and people go, well, that's Marxist. You're just saying Marxist stuff. And he's like, no, bitch. Reality is Marxist. <laughs> like, you know, like, like it is what it is. Like, I, you know, I'm just... 
Yeah. And I think he may he may have been he may have been paraphrasing like he may have even been sort of echoing something Che Guevara said years ago, which is that reality is Marxist, which that's true. Um, and uh, but yeah, I mean, it's that's the whole thing. I have a problem with a lot of those sort of like, I mean, you can't call them the IDW anymore because that's done. That's a dead that's a dead letter. Right. So, yeah. like, well, what do you fucking call these people? I don't know. You know, the, the reactionary the, right. The, the extreme center. <laughs> I think that's that's reactionary right yeah or um that's a book i might want to do for book club at some like book club for our discussion is a really great book by Tariq ali called the extreme center okay where he kind of goes through and discusses some of these very problems right because it is the, these people describe themselves as like the extreme center yeah yeah you know it used and to be classical liberal and then it liberals and, yeah but the all, thing is yeah uh, like james Lindsay, like say uh he full on supported Trump during the last election. And now uh, like Eric Weinstein or Brett Weinstein, maybe both of them are like yeah. full on anti-vax conspiracy nut jobs. over yep. this. Like, well, and, and, and Brett Weinstein believes in the whole lab league thing, which again, yeah. I'm not saying isn't true. I'm saying that like, I'm really bothered by like how many people have bought into this shit hook, line and sinker. Like these yeah. are the same people who are like critical of Russia gate. They were critical of the rock, the Iraq W the motherfucker who wrote the article about the lab leak in the wall street journal was the co-author of the Iraq WMD article from 2002, <laughs> right. 2003. Right. So the you know, same motherfucker. Is, yeah. And it's like, and it's like, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to like uh, say this shit. People are like, Oh, you're fucking tanky. Or you're like carrying water for the Chinese. Like, no, you know, cause this, I don't know. <laughs> there's not and sufficient the evidence is, to say that there's a lab no. leak. <laughs> no, there isn't. And yet people are acting like it fucking is. And they're like spinning these fucking tales about Fauci's emails and shit. And it's like, guys, yeah, you know, physician, heal thyself. <laughs> like understand, understand that like the same shit you said about like Rachel Maddow when she was doing the Russiagate thing, you're doing the same fucking shit right now with this. Yeah, that's right. And it's like, you need to like, you know, and then they'll, they'll always... I think this is what the skeptics guide to the universe guys used to call it. They call it jacking off. Yeah. Which yep. is I'm just, just asking, asking questions. Just asking questions. Yeah, that's right. And it's like, no motherfucker, like you have an agenda. <laughs> and it's like, and even people I like and that I read or listen to consistently have sort of been more um, I interested in the sort of lab leak thing. Like I know that like it's, I get it. He's a bomb thrower, but I read Glenn Greenwald. I still do. <laughs> and, and uh, I, I like, uh, like I interviewed Ben Burgess. I like uh -huh. Ben Burgess. He's got a soft spot for Glenn Greenwald. And every yep. time he brings it up, I have to shut off the episode. I can't listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the great Glenn Greenwald. <laughs> Here's the thing about Glenn, right? So like, I think that dude is probably the journalist of my generation. I mean, there, I don't think there's anybody. I mean, I know he's older than me, but like, but I do think that the problem is, is that I think there is this, the intercept burned him bad and they fucked him over. And I, and that's my opinion. I could be wrong about that, but that's my opinion. Right. You're and, not the only person that has that opinion. Like that's, and, that's not a uncommon thing to think. Do I love the fact that he like goes on Tucker Carlson all the time? No, <laughs> I don't like that, but that's, but it's a real sad state of affairs when somebody like him really can't be on like msnbc or like or cnn yeah, like they won't yeah. let him on right yeah and it's because there's a certain orthodoxy that they cannot allow it and i think that 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 you know but i disagree with him profoundly in a lot of stuff matt taibbi is another guy where the shit he wrote about marcuse made me want to vomit i mean it was so stupid <laughs> and uh, you know even smart people have awful takes sometimes well and the thing is, is that, and here's the thing you have to understand right because so doug lane of zero books did a really good interview with glenn where they talked for like two hours or an hour and a half about this whole thing the thing after this about glenn is that glenn doesn't really have like a coherent political ideology mm. and neither does matt Taibbi. neither one of them do they're broadly on the left like on the liberal left, if you want to call it that, but they don't really, they don't really have like an ideology. So that's why, like sometimes right. you'll you'll hear something from me, what the fuck, what the fuck was that? <laughs> and you're like, and you're like, that's weird. Um, but anyway, but like, but 
I just don't, I really, I'm finding it very uncomfortable how many people are just buying into this lab leak thing. Yeah. Because I just don't think it's true. Yeah. And, and the World Socialist website has done an excellent job of like explaining the problems with the lab, lab leak hypothesis. And because yeah. everything these people have so far is just circumstantial shit. It's all they've got. Yep. Yeah. And, it's and I'm so, yeah, not even ahead. solid. It's not even solid connections. Like actually, uh, potholer 54 has done some good videos on yeah. this on YouTube. Okay. Uh, Rebecca Watson did a great one too. Okay. Yeah. Um, her, hers was, that, I love her. I think she's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I, I think she's one of the few people from this space who was amazing, you know, and she, man, she gets, she gets so much shit, but she's so good. Yeah. And she got <laughs> the, the atheist and skeptic community owes Rebecca Watson a huge apology. <laughs> <laughs> oh fucking a. <laughs> like, fucking a. Can we also talk about the fact that like in an era we are we are almost five years post Me Too. Right. How the fuck does Michael Shermer get to walk around? I don't know. I don't Why know how this happens. What the fuck? Yeah. Like I, it's it's and what I find funny about him too is that like his whole thing is skeptic magazine or whatever. Ugh. But then it's it, but it's all it's just right wing drivel. Like yeah. I wouldn't read it. Did you uh you, do you know who Harriet Hall is? She was uh Harriet Hall? Yeah. Yes, the the yeah, she wrote for um Science Based Medicine for yeah. Stephen Avella's thing. Yeah, and she recently wrote an article that got kicked off of uh Science Based Medicine. Uh it's a book review about this that transgender uh craze or whatever book that was put out a couple of years ago that basically claimed that uh the more we talk about gender and transgender women uh the more girls are going to go want to be men and the more it's going <laughs> to make <we're... laughs> oh my god so okay 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 so this is the lesbian genocide thesis right yeah yeah i, yeah, it's I find shit. it hilarious <laughs> yeah the whole the great dying off of the lesbians it's like the sixth math, mass extinction event we're going to get rid of you know the last of like the you know trust me okay at the end of the world there's going to be a few things there's going to be tardigrades there's going to be Keith Richards. There's going to be lesbians. Like, don't like <laughs> this idea that the lesbians are going to go away is just obscene to me. Yeah. And Harriet Hall, someone who I have greatly respected over the years, because I think her writing on almost everything has been really fucking good. Yeah. That's really sad to hear that. That's yeah. really when it turns really out sad. she's uh, like gone full turf. Oh, <laughs> that's a bummer, yeah. man. That's a well. I mean, that was the whole controversy. Was it a year or two ago with that fucker on YouTube? Oh, uh, what's his name? Uh, I, I think his channel's name is Rationality Rules, and I oh, don't remember yep, if you yep. carried, carried this, the whole the whole trans athlete situation. And Matt Dillahunty basically shoved his head up his ass, and the atheist community of Austin had to do damage control because he yeah. came off looking like a prick. Surprise! Um, <laughs> and yeah, it was like this is all the shit I want to write about in this book, like where I just yeah. think like, which this this the. the my thesis of my book in my head is basically the atheist movement is shit, but it doesn't have to be right. And here's how it could be better. And I think like there was some really good stuff that happened recently. Like the American humanist association rescinding Dawkins as humanist of the year award. That's good. very good. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Very good thing. And I think we talked about it the last time about how in typical fashion, because he's <laughs> Dawkins is bitch. Dennett went to his defense of course. That was a great thing. I think the American Humanist Association is one of the few organizations that's great. I got really no beefs with them. Yeah. Um, Center for Center for Inquiry is garbage, which breaks my heart because that organization was started by Paul Kurtz, who was basically forced out of his organization because he hated Dawkins. Right. And he hated the new atheists and was like, these people suck. They're assholes. We shouldn't have anything to do with them. And it's really sad that the organization that he helped founded is now merged with the Dawkins people like that. That's like, it, I'm so glad that, that Paul Kurtz didn't live to see that. Cause he yeah. would, he would just be pissed. CFI and in, uh, in Canada has been better. Uh, I bet there's been like, it's really weird. Cause I talked to Sienna Watson, who's like the, uh, vice chair or something like she's right up there with, in the leadership of the organization. And the, <laughs> There's all these really good people at the head of the organization, but somehow they I, keep having all these really shitty speakers. <laughs> like, yep. I don't understand what's happening. But. So for me, it always goes back to the way we view the world, brother. Follow the money. 
Yeah. Who's the donor? Who's the donor base, right? Yeah. I, my thinking on the subject is why did the Dawkins Foundation merge with CFI in the first place? And I think a lot of it was both organizations knew they would be better together than they would be apart financially. I think that CFI might have been in money issues, um, or the Dawkins Foundation might have been in money issues, and they were like, "Let's merge." Yeah, like these are uh, not anti-capitalist uh, organizations, right? So no, 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 no. Nor should they be. I mean, I mean, I would no, argue maybe right. nor should they be. You know, I think these should be universal organizations. Yeah. What I would advocate for is that we need an alternative where we need a left-wing secular humanist organization, an organization that's dedicated to, you know, some kind of left wing, you know, and yeah. while I respect DSA, that's not really their function. Like, right. I, you know, or, like, you know, or like PSL or other, like that they're specifically like political action. Like that's what they do. Yeah. But the idea of creating some kind of like CFI for leftists is something that I think is important. That would be cool. Um, and maybe it's superfluous. I mean, I don't know, but like, there's just not enough people in this space who have that interaction between skeptical you know, skepticism, critical thinking, humanism, and <laughs> yeah. you know, Marxism or anarchism. Like, they're just they're not they're few or far between because there's just not a market for it, right? Like, yeah. I used to I used to joke all the time, like, like shit, man. If both you and I became conservative Christians, we would fucking clean up. All like, we'd have we to do would, is make a "Why We Left the Left" video, right? All we have to do, right? <laughs> Gregor, you'd come fucking marching in. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, because they love that kind of shit. And the yeah. thing is, it's like that shit goes back to like the 50s, man, with like James Burnham and, and Whitaker Chambers, these guys who were were who Marxists, some of, and I think Burnham was even a Trotskyist, who then became virulent right-wingers. A lot of people did, though. This, it, this is where, this is like my critique of, Along other things of Trotskyism, a lot of Trotskyists end up being virulent, disgusting right-wingers. I don't really know why. They just do. Um, yeah, like somebody like uh, David Horowitz or, or, you know, like they just become, right. they go from being, you know, international socialist revolution to I love Trump. And it's like, whoa, where'd you go? What happened there? <laughs> what happened there? It's very strange. But like, ultimately, you know, it, it's the, the secular movement needs needs a left yeah. and it needs and it because you know but the thing is it's like i, I mean i'm listening i listened to that great episode you did with your mind i'm like is the secular movement dead i mean there's kind of an argument to be made that it kind of is yeah i and think maybe i think by and large it is uh i mean there's they still exist but they don't have any of the numbers they used to have or any of the support they used to have so i don't know no yeah, it's like it's like it's like all of the atheist people all became like, you know, trad right shit bags. It's interesting. Like I don't, uh, it, and here's the thing, dude. I was real close. I think a lot of us were. You know, we, who were in that. I was real close to being that. Like I got close, <laughs> and and it was the moment. Like, because my whole thing was my politics were thoroughly neoliberal. Like that's right. who I was, and I didn't really know it. Like my whole thing was like. I love, like, I'm all for LGBTQ equality. I'm pro-choice. Like, I'm, you know, but I also believe that, like, capitalism is the greatest wealth creation system in human history. And, like, that's how we're going to create the progress that we need. And, like, that was that was what I believe. And I found myself com completely being at odds. Like, I'm, like, with, like, Dave Rubin and others. So I'm, like, I get you with, like, the economic message. Like, I'm, you know, because back then I was a bootlicker. But, like, <laughs> um but like the, all this like social shit is like disgusting. Like why would you pal around with like racists and like xenophobes right. and like, yeah. what the fuck is wrong with you? And uh, that was really the wake up call. That's when I realized I'm like, Oh, this is what it's really all about. <laughs> oh shit. Yeah. yeah you that's know? right. Yeah. But, like as soon as it became, as soon as it became more profitable to be uh against the anti anti against any social justice progress yep. uh, that's when they really stuck to their guns like i was even yeah. defending sam harris right up when he wrote that book with majid nawaz on yep, me too. Uh, you know reforming islam i was like on board and then something else happened after that. i can't remember for me <laughs> I, for me the, the big shift with sam harris was the charles murray interview Oh that, yeah, that yeah. was the moment where I realized I'm like, holy fuck. Well, I, and yeah, I was I was pretty anti Sam Harris at that point already, and, and <laughs> good for you. <laughs> I remember like 
we uh, we argued on brainstorm about that because my co-host yep. Lisa was like trying to defend Sam Harris, and I was like, no, he's fucking wrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yeah. And the, the thing is, is like, imagine because here's the thing, right? I was a bit of a Sam Harris completion. I've read every book he's ever written. Right. With the exception of like the waking up book. That's just like a transcript of his podcast, which doesn't count as a book in my opinion. No, that's right. It's not a real book. Also, isn't it interesting that the man has not put out like a full length book of like his own original work in like seven years. <laughs> it's kind of like he knew where the, he knew where the real money was. He's like, fuck this. Yeah. I'm just going to become a podcaster. I, I find that fascinating. Um, also, cause I think, also, yeah. has he even had an original thought? <laughs> no. I, uh, do you he's, listen to uh, Polite Conversations? With uh, uh, oh, I have in the past. I have in the past. And I know, because that was some of the stuff I, because here's the thing, dude. We're not, where I was at in like 2018, when I was like getting out of like the, the sort of atheist movement, I was getting out of like the, the IDW bullshit. Um. It was very hard to find any stuff that was critical. It's very, very hard. And the stuff that I found was was Michael Brooks, ContraPoints, and and Anya. That those were yeah. the three. And I and so I listened to the stuff that she put out. And I went, holy shit. And I was like, okay, here we go. This is this is right. Like this is I get this. Like you can be critical of religion and you can also not be a racist imperialist like Sam Harris. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, her new stuff is like she's she she plays clips from some of Sam's stuff. Like I don't listen oh. to him in any other way. Oh, I wouldn't either. Yeah, <laughs> and, it's like watching it's like watching um, Dave Rubin through Majority Report. Dunk. Yeah, Rubin. yeah, that's right. That's the whole, only time I'm ever going to expose myself to this. Absolutely. And, and he literally just thinks that because he meditates, he's enlightened, and he himself knows his own <laughs> brain so well that he is immune to any bias or or uh, wrong opinions. Like oh, it's Jesus just, Christ. it's just absurd nonsense, like coming out of his he, mouth. Yeah. Well, that's the problem with these guys, right? Is that most of them have a specialty in one specific field, but then they, they're like, I'm going to say, talk about everything. Now, mind you, that's me throwing stones at glass house. Cause I have the same fucking thing. <laughs> right, but, like, but like, but I also admit that like, that's what I'm doing. Like I could be fucking wrong about this. Like, yeah. like the lab leak thing. Like I'm not a fucking epidemiologist. I could be wrong. Okay. I but, have like, sources I, that I trust. And those are the yep. ones that are telling me about this particular thing. Yep. And here's the thing right now. I'm fucking agnostic on the lab leak question. I, I, I'm not, I'm not swayed either way. I don't know. I really don't because there's certain circumstantial evidence that goes, okay, well that's weird. Right. But, but then it's also like, I don't know. It almost like the lab leak thing almost gives humans too much credit. I don't think we're that crafty. But also the Hanlon's razor or whatever, isn't that the one? Uh, attribute to uh, idiocy, what you can, or never attribute to malice, yes. what you can to mal, uh, idiocy. idiocy. Yes. Because <laughs> here's my thing. If the lab leak happened, it wasn't intentional. Yeah. No, if it happened, right. it was a fuck up. Yeah. And and because it would do it, you know, and because lab leaks in and of themselves are fuck ups, the real problem with it is whether or not the cover up was the problem. Right. Right. And, and at this point, I don't know. All I know is that like the, from the people who are more on the side of like the, you know what? I'm getting off a tangent. I interrupted you about Sam Harris. Let's get back to that. Uh, no, I you were talking. <laughs> okay, you were talking about you were talking about Ina talking about Sam Harris oh, and about yeah. how he like he's enlightened. This dude, here's the thing, and this is something that like Michael Brooks really pointed out in a brilliant way, which is that just because somebody is calm does not mean that what they're saying isn't absolutely fucking insane. That's right, and, and like that is important to understand that like Sam Harris is fucking nuts, yeah. and if you were to take. <laughs> his quotes and read them in like a Tucker Carlson or a Alex Jones kind of way they fit. Oh, that, and, that's a great podcast idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, this goes back to, you know, it's, it's the whole, it's like Michael, it's like Michael's characters on in his show when he would do, you know, nation of Islam, Obama, right. Or right wing Mandela or yeah. I mean, he, he was the, he was the, 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 and and the thing is, it's like, 
This is where I almost have more. I don't. I don't want to go that far. It's almost <laughs> where I have more. Not more respect. It's not the right word, but I have more understanding of somebody like Jordan Peterson because he's a crank, but he fucking sounds like one. Yeah. And I admi- I appreciate that. Like if you're a crank, I just want you to just sound be like a one. crank. <laughs> yeah. And there are cranks that I love. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, like I love Michael Prenti. Right. You know, look up look up his speech where he's like fucking pounding a podium and he's like, I support the revolution that allows people to fucking eat. You know? Have you ever learned not known how to read? Have you never seen that? He goes off and it's beautiful because he's yeah. really passionate. I like that kind of shit. Oh, for sure. But that's no indication of whether or not the content is, is true or that that's it's right. good, right? Yeah, that's right. You know, I find it fascinating that Sam Harris has a career because the man is like anti-charisma. I know. Like it, he has no <laughs> charisma. It's fascinating. He could I seem to think I think that he could only have a good job as like a voiceover for like a putting you to sleep book. Yep. <laughs> yep. But yet some people listen to him every week, multiple times to, you know, I don't understand. I just don't. And it's that. like, and he's just got his Rolodex of bullshit. Like he's not, I don't find him to be particularly that intellectually curious. I just don't no. think he is. No, I don't think so either. Um, he and came up I, with a few ideas and that, and that was where he decided to stop. And he's hit fucking cruise control for like 15 years. Yeah. But the other thing you have to understand is he's a trust fund baby. Right. Like, like that's the thing you got to understand. His mom was the fucking creator of the Golden Girls. <laughs> if this dude never had to work a day. In, like, you, sh- you read the book and you go, he's like, I did all these meditation retreats and I went around to India and I went over here and there. I'm like, who, who, the, paid fuck for that? The, money? who the fuck paid for that? <laughs> like, you drop out of college and then you go do this shit for like eight years and you come, like, who the fuck paid for? Oh. There it is. It's because your mom was the creator of the fucking Golden Girls and like your trust fund kid. Like yeah. you, you, if he, ne- he would never have had to work a day in his life. So it's, that makes all the more sense. Yeah. yeah. That it's like, okay, okay. That, you know, and it's, it's like, you know, and all of those guys, they're all children of privilege. Yeah. Like I always wondered because the things that they were saying were not particularly original. I'd heard no. other people say, similar things before uh but never who never Robert got Anderson the said some of that shit 150 years ago you know <laughs> right. 140 years ago it's the same shit so like, how did sam harris become a superstar in the way like when i first discovered him he was already charging thousands of dollars for speaking engagements yeah so how did that happen like it he's just wrote a book lots of people write books <laughs> Well, and this goes back to think to when we discussed Dennett's book, where we talked about the zeitgeist of the time. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I th- and I think they rode a wave, man. I really do. I think it was the right thing at the right time, and it hit. The other thing too is that the other here's the other big thing about the new atheists that's really important. They fundamentally are not dangerous. Right. To yeah. Empire. That's right. Yeah. You know, there's a great article in Jacobin. I think by Luke Savage called new atheism, same old empire. Yeah. And this was written like in 2014. This was back when I was still a shit bag. Like, you know, like, and it's, it's, it's a great article. And he did an episode of citations needed, which is like my favorite podcast ever besides yours, of course. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and um, where he, they went into this kind of shit that like fundamentally, if you read the new atheists, they're just saying the kind of shit that justifies, I mean, there, it's it's an intellectualization of neoconservatism that's palatable to a liberal audience. Yeah. yeah. And that's what it is. Yeah. Um, ultimately, you know, and I mean, we talked about this with the Dennett one where there's this long fucking passage towards the end of his book, which is this sort of long soliloquy about human freedom. And if you ultimately read between the lines, what he's essentially saying is the hate, the hate is for our freedom. It's right. the George Bush yeah. shit. Yeah. But he's, just, you know, and... You know, it's also like Pete, like him, like there's an incredible lecture that Edward Said did where he criticized the clash of civilizations thesis by Samuel Huntington, because that's what Sam Harris peddles in. It's just a, it's just a cheap ass version of Samuel Huntington. That's what it is. It's yeah. the whole Islam versus the West shit. <laughs> it's, he's getting it from Huntington. You know, it's not it's not that particularly unique or interesting. Right. No. And so Said did this excellent lecture where he critiqued Samuel Huntington's thesis. 
And I shit you not, if you took that lecture and, and you just took out Huntington's word name and you put Harris's name, it matches right. because it's this, it's exactly what the whole thesis is. Yeah. You know, we talked about that before, like Islam versus what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> like, first off, first off, like Islam is a part of Western civilization. Yeah, okay? that's right. Like dipshit. Like what? I mean, where do you think? <laughs> <laughs> who the fuck preserved Aristotle and Plato? Like, yeah. the fuck is wrong? who created fucking algebra? Like, what is wrong with you? You know? And it's it's because, because here's the thing you have to understand. When they say the West, that's the modern version of Christendom. Yeah, that's right. That's what they mean. Yeah. And, and it's like, and they add the Judeo-Christian shit in there, which is a fairly new concoction because, you know, Christians feel guilty about the Holocaust, as they right. should. Right, yep. Um, and, um, but like, they never really want to include the Jews in that project either. No. Like it, it, and so, you know, I almost have more, sometimes I almost have more respect for, for fanatics because at least I know what I'm dealing with. But the problem with Sam Harris is that he is a fucking fanatic, but he dresses it up in this like, yeah, pseudo kind of flowery, intellectual, pseudo yeah. intellectual kind of flowery language yeah. that kind of gets to the heart of it. And you're kind of like. That's why it's so important to read him, read him, <laughs> because listening to him and reading him are two different things. Right. And I've and I actually read The End of Faith as a hate read because I had gotten through all of his other books. Oh, OK. Um, and I was like, I was a completionist at that time. And I was like, I need to finish this book. Uh, and it's horrible. Yeah, no, it's not. Good. And here's the thing, dude. The End of Faith, everything he put in any other book he ever published, it's all in The End of Faith. If you read The End of Faith, you've read everything he's ever written. Right. And, and I mean, truly, like, I'm not fucking around. Like, it's like ACDC. It's like, if you've heard the one ACDC song, you've kind of heard them all. <laughs> yeah. Although I love ACDC. But it's like, with Sam Harris, if you read the, read the End of Faith, it's all there. Like, everything, his whole worldview is right there. He also is a terrible writer in one particular respect, which is that he absolutely fucking backloads his books with endnotes. Oh, okay. Instead of concluding them in the main body of the text. Right. So like the end of faith is like a 200 page book right. that has like 89 pages of notes because he has these long fucking tangents in the back of the book. And I'm like, my thing on the subject is you need to put that shit in the body of your text or it's not important. Yeah. You know? I look at endnotes. I look at notes more as like citations, and then brief little asides. Like for more information on this, see this book. Or I'm using this term this specific way from this sort. Like it's explanatory, right? And or if you're going to have those long notes, put them as 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 footnotes where you right. can read them with the text. Because Marx is like that. He has long footnotes that go with the books. But he has so. I've never had to flip back and forth so much in my life in reading a book. And it's really hard to follow because you're, because he's constantly making fucking tangents. Right. Most of which aren't important. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, he's a fucking hack. I mean, he's a, and he, and I would, I would argue that he's of the four horsemen. He's far and away the dumbest. I there's, think so. I think that, that yeah. seems like uh, an easy argument to win. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's far and away the dumbest. I always found that funny because Hitchens always sort of saw himself as being the dumb one of the group. And I'm like, no, you're not, dude. You're not. It's funny. Well, you that are he dumb. Thought but... that. Like, I actually thought, like, I thought that Hitchens. Having a, yeah, having a fucking PhD after your name does a lot. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I always thought that <laughs> Hitchens was one of the smart, like, smarter ones. I never gave Richard Dawkins that much credit. Uh, uh, Harris always seemed like the 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 school kid to the adults in my uh, you know and then Dennett I always thought he was the heavyweight but then he was like you say like he was always kind of just reciting what Dawkins is saying so yeah there's nothing terribly original about him either I mean the only thing I would say it's probably the most original part of his work is the idea of the intentional stance like that whole thing like mm. that's like that's kind of original to him but again, it's like he's in an he's in an atmosphere, right? Like no one like no one's totally original. And I don't want to like say, oh, we're well, not original true. enough. But but I mean, then it's also a hack. I mean, that was the thing I did like we talked about it. Like that's what I discovered reading Break of the Spell. I went, yeah. Oh shit, he's a hack too. What yeah, um, this is trash. <laughs> this is trash too. It's like, you know, it's a, it's just you ever like in life sometimes you have these like little like little like 
anxieties or little things in the back of your mind. And you try to push them away because you're just trying to get to life. But sometimes you should really pay attention to them. <laughs> and 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 I did that a lot with when I read Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now, mm. where I was going through the book and I found myself having a lot of problems with it. But I was too afraid to say them. Right. Because I didn't want to like upset like the atheist orthodoxy that I had bought into. And also Steven Pinker is also a fucking dipshit. Yeah. He's a hack and, too, uh, actually. And uh, powered around <laughs> with a pedophile. So yeah. 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 He's a hacks piece of shit as well. Um, and doesn't understand philosophy is also really dumb. Like about philosophy. Like he doesn't get it. At right. All. When we were talking earlier about how like the new, like modern atheists or secularists kind of misinterpret the enlightenment. I was mainly talking about Pinker. Like he doesn't get it. Right. Um, yeah. And he simplifies it and sort of, you know, and um, or the, a lot of atheists will pull a thing of like, oh, well, he really was an atheist, but he couldn't come out because of the time. We don't fucking know that. That's counterfactual. Like, yeah, you're just asserting what you th want to believe into the yeah. situation. Yeah, exactly. Like, like Francis Bacon was not an atheist or Kant <laughs> was not an atheist. Like, no, I thought we knew that Francis Bacon definitely was not an atheist. <laughs> yeah, like, like, it's like, it's, it's, it's like. These people are not atheists in the sense that they that people think like, yeah. um, you know, and it's like, but and also like he has a whole section in the book about how the left loves to um, idolize dictators. Um, of course, he says that. Yeah. And that he, he it's called tyrannophilia. And then he talks he 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 has the shittiest take on Nietzsche ever. It's like the cheapest like. Wow boring bullshit it's like it's just it's it's so boring <laughs> like it, it's and when you go back and look at it you're just like oh my god this is boring and it's like it's like dude you could you keep talking about human progress so why does any human progress happens it happens because a collective of people decided to rise up and say this is fucking wrong yep exactly and and so i find it upsetting to me that like he, Steven Pinker would have been one of those white moderates that MLK wrote about. Yeah, That's like he weird. he literally thinks that just change just eventually happens. Yeah, <laughs> and, and like in in Better Angels of Our Nature, that's every, he he's going on about how things used to be this way and now they're not, and this they used to be this way and now they're not. But he never actually examines why that happened. <laughs> like, well, and he, he exactly right. It's all like that's why. Um, Neil Ferguson, the historian, not great either. Um, <laughs> he uh, he wrote in the front of the book or the back of the book that it was like an important work of historiography, which is true. Like <laughs> what what Pinker is doing is not history; it's historiography, which is him writing about history. It's history yeah. about history because he's not getting, like you said, he's not getting into root causes. The other thing too is that he's also doing some fucking bullshit math in that book. Oh yeah, yeah. Where, where he's like talking about like the percentages of the amount of people killed within a tribe versus the percentage of a population today. And look how they're lower. It's like, motherfucker, like you're comparing thousands of people to millions of people. Like if, if you did this, if you did this on just sheer numbers alone, we're not talking about percentages. The reason you needed percentages is because you can do that nice little graph that shows violence going down. Yeah, that's right. If you did that in absolute terms, if you did it in absolute numbers, it would have to go like this. Yeah. Like, you know, like it's, it's just a framing it's, mechanism, right? Yeah, it's it's a framing mechanism that's based on an ideological position. Yeah. This is the biggest problem I have with him or Sam Harris or any of these pricks. <laughs> and this is where I think Jordan Peterson is almost more intellectually honest in that he share, he basically he puts it out on his sleeve. Yes, I'm a Christian conservative, and that's what I think you should be too. Right. Like he, he's pretty fucking honest about it about yeah. his ideological. He's, he's traditional. He's he believes in uh, men and women and patriarchy. <laughs> Yes. And he's pretty goddamn clear about it when he, yeah. when he chooses to be right. Yeah. But he has a clear ideological commitment. These people love like Pinker and others. They love to act as if they're non ideological. It's like the better angels of our nature or enlightenment. Now those other books, they're extremely ideological projects. Yeah. And then Steven Pinker also has the whole, I'm just a nice guy. I speak calmly. And that hides the fact that what I'm saying is absolutely batshit. Yeah. It's, it's because if you, again, I also, I, I encourage people, don't listen to Steven Pinker talk. 
read him. Read him. <laughs> yeah. Because if you read him, you get the sense that he is an extremely petty asshole. That like yeah. he's also again not terribly intellectually curious, like not interested, not really interested in philosophy. You know, um, you know, trashes. You know, he he sort of trashes a lot of left wing science. Um, you know, he's not. He's just not. He He's was the cool. one that I held out the longest on until me too. Uh, until like the Me Too thing started happening and he started pushing back on it uh, <laughs> on Twitter. And I was like, what? But why are you doing that? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Well, now we know why. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Is that you of Mr. Jeffrey Epstein, I presume? And you just go, holy shit. This yeah. is why. This is fucking why. And it's like, oh my God. Well, that's the thing. These, all of these people, they were all in this fucking orbit. Yeah. All right. of them were. And, you know, I mean, because like Jeffrey Epstein wanted to create his own fucking master race of like fucking dumbass, shabby accountants. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like really funny. Yeah. Like, but like, you know, if there's a dude, if there's a sort of radical center douche, chances are he's got a picture with Epstein. And it's, yep. it's, Kind of amazing. I love that people are finally getting, are finally understanding that Bill Gates is an asshole. That is. It should have happened yeah, earlier. Delicious. <laughs> He's a prick too. Yeah. Should have fucking happened 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's a son bitch. Also, did you know that Bill Gates is the single largest landholder of farmland in the United States now? I did not. And that kind of fucked up. Yeah, that's pretty fucked up. <laughs> He was also basically the shadow secretary of education during the Obama years. Like common core was all his thing. Like, right. Why, and again, it's like, why should one asshole have this much power? Yeah. Like, like, what the fuck? It's so weird. Like this fucker doesn't have a degree in anything. Yeah. Like what's his I background in education? Yeah. How is he related to that? He doesn't. He doesn't have a background in education. He doesn't have a background in epidemiology. He doesn't have a background in climate science. He doesn't have a background in public health. It's just the only reason that people pay attention to him is he's a rich asshole. Yeah. That's it. You're rich. Therefore, you know things somehow. Yeah. Like I have two college degrees. I have exactly two more college degrees than Bill Gates has. <laughs> okay. And it's like, yeah. And I find it funny. They're like, oh, it's a self-made man. Bullshit. Bullshit. His mom was on the fucking board of directors for IBM. That's how he got the in. Yeah. That's how he got the fucking in. He went to fucking Exeter and he was going to fucking Harvard when he dropped out to go to my, my ass. They say yeah. the same shit about Jeff Bezos too. Jeff Bezos was a Yale educated day trader who quit his job to do what he was doing. Who yeah. got a generous loan from his fucking parents. Yeah. No that, one is self-made. Elon Musk. Same story. Elon Musk. Super rich it's family. Fucking, it's, <laughs> fucking blood jewels from fucking South Africa. Yep. His family made money off of fucking apartheid. Like it's, this is where anytime you see some self-made asshole, self-made, very yeah. big quotes, you got to study the history. But this is the problem I go back to. We talked about with, when we talked about Michael Perini, most journalists are idiots. Mm. Most of them are particularly curious. And most of them are people who are sycophants. They would much rather just suck up to power right. and make money. Like, for example, you know Andrea Mitchell? She's this journalist who's on MSNBC. Uh, I don't think so, no. Good for you. That's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the correct answer. She's been on MSNBC for in NBC News for years. She, okay. She's very milk toast, whatever. You know who she's married to? Who? She's married to Alan fucking Greenspan. Oh, good, yes. The uh, former chairman of the Federal Reserve. Like... <laughs> It's like it's the it's the fucking George Carlin thing. It's a it's a little club. And we're not in it. <laughs> yeah, and and right. it's like when you realize it, it's like that's why like I'm not a QAnon conspiracy theorist. Obviously, I'm not like into Pete's Gate or whatever. But like when when these people say like oh there's like a secret cabal of pedophiles that rule the world, I'm like you're not that far off. Yeah, no, you're almost there. Sort you're so of. Close. You're <laughs> sort of right. <laughs> Yeah. You're sort of right. And I even I even tend to feel empathy for their reasoning, right? Fucking A, I do too. Like, of course you feel alienated from your labor, and of course you feel like you'd have no power and no say in the society, because we don't. So Yeah. 
And it's, and I get that, you know, I understand that completely, which is part of the reason why, like the difference between us and I think a lot of liberals is that we have compassion for everyone, regardless of whether or not they're, they're horrible. Yeah. And it's like, I have a lot of compassion for people who are ideologically, you know, grotesque, but, but it's because I just, I genuinely believe that like a lot of this kind of shit is when we've talked about this before, it's like, they're so close. Yeah. You are so close to fucking getting it. You're so close. And that's why I can't be too mad because there's a part of me that's like, you almost get it. You almost yeah. get it. And, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's crazy to me. I mean, it's so funny to watch like all of the leaders of this sort of broader secular movement just completely be, I mean, I, it's like Shermer when that happened, when the Lawrence Krauss thing happened, that one hit me hard. Cause I was like, Holy shit. And there are numerous ones about him, and there's a cover-up involving him with CFI. Yeah, um, yeah, and, that's a uh, rough one. I that's that's the Lawrence Krauss situation is when I actually lost respect for Matt Dillahunty. Oh yes, I I, I, I get you on that. His sure. reaction and like he was still doing on stage stuff while that was coming out with Krauss, and he was you know being like, oh well, you know the evidence. We gotta wait for the yeah. evidence, or kind of like. Claims like this are like, he compared it to uh, ghosts, claims about ghosts. Oh, Jesus. And I was like, okay, that's not the same thing, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. But that's disgusting. Yeah. That's disgusting, man. Like, you know, it's that. I mean, there, but the thing is, is like, if cancel culture was real, and it's not, but if cancel <laughs> culture was real, all these motherfuckers would be gone. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's, they're just certain people and they're, they're all kind of fucked up. I mean, I'm sorry, but like, I won't have anything to do with Neil deGrasse Tyson either. No, that's right. Yeah. I won't have anything to do with him anymore, which breaks my heart. Cause I really loved cosmos and I know it's not written by him, but I won't watch it. Yeah. I can't, I, I, I can't watch, watch it. it. I can't watch I it because watch I, it. I've, I've heard, I've read too many stories, uh, about him. <laughs> so I was like, ah. Okay, also, okay. he is not like Carl Sagan at all. No, no, that's he, right. He's not, he's not kind. He's not warm. No. He just comes off like an asshole most of the time. And then you add to that the fact that he he actively, like, even if you c can dismiss any allegations against yep. him, even if you can get past the fact that he's not kind, he's dis completely dismissed philosophy. He just says dis philosophy yes. is useless. Which makes him intellectually, uh, like a not intellectually curious person. Yes, <laughs> so. I agree. And it's and it, and it's clearly you know he did not take the fucking le lesson from his mentor. No, no. Um, you know, um, which by the way, I've always felt like the Cosmo Show exaggerated that, and I think it has. Um, yeah. But like it's, I mean, I I. Ugh. It's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. Plus he all, he's just a fucking buzzkill. Um, and the way his podcast was formatted was horrible. Oh, was that right? I don't, I don't know if you ever listened to star talk, but when he would do interviews, it was excruciating because oh, geez. here's the thing. And it had nothing really to do with him. It had everything to do with the way the format was. It was like somebody it was like a podcast for someone with like fucking ADHD where they would they would do a segment of the interview for like a minute or two and they would cut to a panel to talk about the two minutes they just listened to <laughs> and then it would go back and forth back and forth for 30 minutes i found it insufferable no kidding yeah and i'm like why can't you people just let me listen to the whole interview and then, and then talk you can, about it and then you can talk about it <laughs> yeah that's right and i found that just to be excruciating it's like, the sam harris end notes of podcasts <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. It's awful. Um, he. I just also think. I just think that. I also think like, the one thing that you could never say about Carl Sagan is that he was never smug. And and Neil deGrasse Tyson is 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 nothing but smug. Yeah, I mean, he's yeah. extremely smug, and um, and glib, and just comes off like a prick. I mean. It's like, oh my God, where uh, with Virgil Texas of Chapo. Oh, okay. Formerly of Chapo. I don't know if you heard about this, but apparently he groomed a 16 year old girl. Um, and uh, 
And well, and it was like a month or so ago where the Chapo guys did this little segment where they said um, uh, Virgil's no longer going to be part of the main, of the cast anymore. He's going off to his other projects. We wish him the best of luck. And I didn't think anything of it. Right. Well, now it's like, okay. And so there's a part of me that's like, oh, shit. Because I love Chapo. But it's like, if they're not going to address this, there's a part of me that's like, come on, guys. Yeah, that's right. You know? It, it makes it tough on. to be like, give them the benefit of the doubt if they're not even going to like yeah. speak to it. Right. Right. Cause I just think it's bad. It just looks bad, you know? And so, and he's been Virgil, Texas has basically been radio silent for like a week and a half now. Oh, okay. Cause that shit came out on the 9th of June and, and he's just been, he's just disappeared. Wow. Um, so I imagine that something's going to happen, but when I learned that, I think yesterday, the day before I went, Oh God. Um, but it's just, it's, you know, I don't think it's the same thing. I think it's important not to flatten all these things and make them the same thing. But like at the same time, it just sucks to hear that kind of shit. You go, yeah. oh man, that's a bummer. Yep. Well, I mean, it's 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 similar to uh, Pendulette as well. I, I read a story about him uh, where it was it was a, I guess a similar situation where somebody who was underage was taken to his place in Vegas or something for some reason. And, uh, he got them to stay multiple times and then like, yeah. And you go, okay, well now I don't like you. Not that he was great before, but, but you add, you add the whole grooming and raping of, uh, young people onto it. And it's extra gross. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know anything about that with Pendulette. I pretty much don't have anything to do with that anymore. I, I, he was one of the first people I sort of dropped off. Yeah. Um, just cause he's a libertarian dipshit. Um, but it's, you know, I mean, I go back now, like, like bullshit was really important to me. Yeah. And, and, and going back and watching it, there's a lot of it. that's just awful. Yes. And, and you <laughs> like there, there's like, there's like, you know, there's like simping for Walmart and there's like, you know, climate denial and there's climate change denial and there's pro secondhand smoke. Like there's all kinds of stuff. It's just, yeah, what that's the fuck? And there, the one, like I, at the time that I, that the bullshit came out, I was really into bodybuilding and I was into supplements and a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And they did an episode on that and it was, I was okay, so I learned some things about that I didn't know about supplements and the laws surrounding them and how they don't have to regulate uh, what's in them. But then they did this thing where they interviewed a person who worked in a supplement shop. And the person was like, yeah, you can't drink energy drinks and take this pre-workout because a friend of mine had a stroke. <laughs> and I was like, well, how do you know those are connected? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, like I, I get that you're trying to be dramatic, and I, I get the, you know the causation, uh, you know, sometimes is the case. And energy drinks are not great, and pre workout supplements are not great. But how yeah. do you draw that conclusion there? Like you just yeah. you don't know, <laughs> right? Right. You're just I a mean, person who works in a shop, <laughs> right? I think the, the one, the, I mean, the, the simping for Walmart episode one was the one that really stuck yeah. in my craw. Cause there was a part of me that was like, um, it just kind of gave up the game. Right. Which is like, like libertarians are all about liberty and freedom. But then when it comes to like huge yeah. corporations that have control over people's lives and, and they like interviewed this young woman who was a single mom who had a job and she's like clearly like basically hostage by the system itself. Yeah. You know, and and it's like, and, and there was a young black woman, so again, it kind of has like subtle racism within it too, and you know, and it's also like a lot of the people they talk to, like they're talking heads, right? Yeah. yeah, is you know whether it's you know John Tierney of the New York Times, who's a right winger, or the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, or the Cato Institute, yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the heartland, like there are all these like rabid right wing Coke funded think tanks. Yeah. And I think the biggest problem I have with that show is that they would, they would, they would find the silliest version of what they were trying to critique. 
Right. Yeah. And show that and then put like somebody in like a, a, a you know, suit and tie who looked really fancy and smart and like, here are the numbers. Yeah. But they have to realize that like, if it's coming from the Cato Institute, they're just as much of a crank as the faith healer you talk to. Yep. And that was a huge problem for me. And then just ultimately like, um, I just, I got to a place in my life where it's like, you just move on. There's just certain yep. things you, yep. you move on from and you're like, I'm done. I'm good. I've had enough of this. I still, I still remember the episode where they, I can't remember exactly what they were discussing, but they were, they had a pie in front of them. And that was the one on taxes. That's oh the yeah. And they're like, I'm just eating all this pie. Oh no, you don't get that pie. I'm eating this pie. <laughs> like, I'm yeah. a, He's like, no, no, no. I'm not, I'm not, you're not, I'm not taking your pie. You're giving that pie to me. And they're like explaining it in this way. And it's like, Ugh. that that episode is infuriating that one's yeah. almost hard very difficult to watch i mean one thing i always thought was was would be interesting and i know like he even pendulet even talked about it he's like we really wanted to do um because they never really got to finish the show the short of just sort of just ended and they didn't get to really wrap right. the show up the way they wanted to but they said you know one episode we always wanted to do was the bullshit of bullshit where we went back and we critiqued stuff that we had done in the past and I thought, well, that would be great. And then I thought, well, wouldn't that be a fun podcast idea? Right. Where you go through each episode of Penn and Teller's bullshit and you 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 debunk the bullshit of bullshit where you go through and you like kind of talk about how fucked up that is or how fucked up that is. There are some episodes that have no that are like whatever, they're fine. Like a lot of the early ones, like like the the talking to the dead, no issue. Right. You know, right. or or like uh uh or the the fucking um uh, feng shui like that one's funny yeah like yeah. there's some of them astrology like, was fine astrology was fine like the faith healing stuff like yeah. that's fun to poke fun at or whatever self-help the shit. climate change one would be destroyed like the whole thing was nonsense oh for sure <laughs> well and the thing is too like it's it's and but the thing is is like they were never they never tried to present themselves as being anything for, than what they were i mean they yeah. were very honest about like this is our perspective which yeah. i respect that that's fine um, but nonetheless, um, you know, it, it, there's, there's a lot of it that's bullshit. It would be kind of fun to revisit and kind of yeah. go through that. And maybe somebody's probably done this, but they, you know, do an episode by episode breakdown of like, you know, this, this stuff is good. This stuff sucks, you know, cause yeah, but the thing is too, is that, that bullshit has a lost episode, which people don't know, but there's a lost episode that they did in the sec, the seventh season which is about the Vatican. Oh yeah. I actually remember that one. I watched they did that. an episode in the Vatican, which you can only watch like by some rips that people had on, on YouTube. Yeah. But that's the lost episode where that one was so blasphemous. Apparently the Catholic <laughs> church was like, we're going to, we're going to fucking go malleus magnificarum on your ass and just burn the shit, burn you at the fucking stake. Yeah. Um, but, and there was like, a, I remember there was like a Roman, like a woman activist who was like critical of the Roman church, Roman Catholic church. And which is sad because that was actually a good one. That was that one's a decent one, um, but but like there's a whole episode with Shermer in it, and it's like I I, I don't feel good about watching that. No, nope, that's right, because he's a fucking sex pest, and you know, or like, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, but I will give them credit. Here's what I'll give them fucking credit because, yeah, they talked to a lot of right wing shit bags, but they had Michael Prinny on twice. Okay. And I will give them credit for that. So they did an episode with Perenni where they had, where he talked about patriotism and how patriotism is bullshit. And they didn't. And then one of my favorite episodes they ever did was holier than thou, which was their critique of like the Dalai Lama, mother Teresa and, okay. the, and Gandhi. And Perenni is one of the foremost critics of the Dalai Lama. Cause if you didn't know the Dalai Lama is a CIA agent that just wants his slaves back. Um, which is, I mean, that's the short, that's the Cliff Notes version. You, you can right. read the long essay that Perini wrote about this. Um, but yeah, like, but one point they always brought up that I found interesting too is that why is it these people never go by their own fucking name? <laughs> like, like the Dalai Lama, his real name is Tenzin Gyatso. Okay. And it's like Mother Teresa, her real name is Agnes Gonzaboyju. And, uh, and, Gandhi's real name was Mohandas K. Gandhi, but he was called the Mahatma or the enlightened one. 
why do they always take on these fucking titles? Yeah. You know, it's not like you're a revolutionary. Like Lenin took on a revolutionary name because he was afraid of being shot. Like there's, right. there's a logic to like people taking on pen names and shit, but the honorifics are what always get me. Yeah. Um, but, but no, Perini was on two episodes. So I'll give them credit where credit's due. They, they, they had somebody like, like Perini on. Um, cause he's easily the most left-wing person they've ever, they will, they right. ever had on the yeah, show. Yeah, for sure. Like bar none. I mean, pretty sure he's probably the only Marxist they ever had on that show. Yeah, um, of course. So, so yeah, but it's very interesting because they didn't have him on to talk about Walmart. Nope. Um, or, or, um, you know, or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that show was very formative to me. I met Penn and Teller, you know, I met him in 2013 when oh. I went out there to Vegas cause I wanted to watch them. Nice. And, uh, so, you know, I look back on all that fondly, but I'm done like that. Yeah. I got to a place in my life where I'm, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Like, like you say, like it was important. It was an important show for bringing me to skepticism for sure. Absolutely. And exposing me to Randy yeah. and, yep. uh, you know, cause I love Randy, um, and, and exposing me to being a critical thinker and to, and to be inquisitive about the world. Yep. You know, and so like that was very important to me. So every once in a while, I'll go back and rewatch some of them. I watch more of the lighthearted ones than I watch like the more serious political ones. Yeah, I can't. I can't even. I can't even go back to it. Like sometimes I will share a clip if I think mm-hmm. that a clip is helpful. Uh, but yeah. then I gotta go find it on YouTube anyway. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, and I didn't even know anything about the Pendulette story you told me. I'll have to look into that because I didn't know, but. He lived, he's lived a weird ass fucking life. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the lines are blurry, but yes, you know, but you know, long story short, but yeah, interesting shit. But yeah, I mean, maybe, I don't know. In our long discussion tonight, there's a part of me that's like, you know, I think the secular movement died and I think that's okay. Like, yeah. There's a part, maybe it's not like, a bad thing. I think that's okay. I, I'm not, you know, I don't think we need it anymore. I don't. And maybe we never needed it. I mean, I, I, there's like a part of me that's like, we're part of a rich heritage, you know, that goes back, you know, to, you know, Epicurus and Democritus. And even before that, you know, yeah. we're part of a, a, a long heritage of free thinkers and skeptics. And, um, you know, and I think that's important. And, and I like celebrating that history. Um, but yeah, it's. But as far yeah. as like the, the community that, like in the, all the conferences and stuff. I'm not, I don't know if it was a net good or not. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the amount of just sexual harassment and assault allegations that came from it. There's a part of me that's like, Ooh. yeah, maybe it was, um, maybe it was worse than it should have. Like, maybe it was worse. I also think of like the rabid atheist guy who killed those two Muslim students. Yeah. I think in, in Chapel Hill or something. And I remember when that happened yeah, I remember and that. all the atheist community had to come out and talk about it. And I'm like, guys, maybe there's a correlation between some of this stuff that we have to talk about because I mean, you brought it up in the episode, I think with Jeremiah that like Richard Spencer is an atheist. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of overlap between people who reject God and people who also like reject humans <laughs> um, and kind of reject humanity and, um, reject humanism in general. Yeah, that's the. I think that's the thing I find. It's like I'm not particularly that concerned or care if you believe in a god or not. That right. doesn't really concern me anymore. What concerns me a lot more is what what you do as a human being and how you interact between yep. yourself and that matters so much more. I you know because you know one of my heroes now is Cornel West. You right. Know, who, who, you know, who is a religious man. Yeah. And I find his religious ideas incredibly vibrant and worthwhile. And, you know, the, he calls the prophetic fire. And, and that's a rich tradition, you know, yep. that's something to talk about when we do Frederick Douglass. Sure, um, yeah. Because in Frederick Douglass, there's a lot of stuff where he's very critical of religion. But he adds this little postscript to the end of the narrative where he says, if you've read up to now, you might think that I'm like, non-religious or anti-religious i'm nothing of the sort and he sort of starts to and then he explains his spirituality and yeah. it's really beautiful i think and yeah yeah i just I, I think that atheism is not a virtue in and of itself yes I, you know i think that's part of the key uh and and like we have like it's it's very much like you said like 
the way you treat people in the here and now, like there's problems with the religious right. There's problems yeah. with, uh, you know, various groups of people who happen to be religious and use that as a cudgel against other people. But For that's, sure. But there, there's plenty of good people who believe in God and, and are religious in one way or another. And yeah, being an atheist isn't a virtue in and of itself. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I think that's really important. That's a really elemental, fundamental truth. The other one that really influenced me was the one that I really understood, which is that religion is greater than the sum of its beliefs. Yeah. It's more than the sum of its beliefs. It's not just about what you believe the sort of new atheist obsession with the beliefs and just in the book, like right, most religious right. people aren't like that. Yeah. You know, you know, religion for them isn't necessarily about like parsing every page of a, of the Bible, like, because that's how you think. That's how you think. That's not how they think. That's how you think. So you right. assume that everybody's like you and they're not. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and so, you know, it, it's important to note that, 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 that's, that, that, Religion is more than just that. And so, you know, religion is about fellowship. Sometimes it's about solidarity. It's about developing, you know, a, a um, worldview that is, com that is compatible with human liberation. That all those, all those are there and you can be religious without any, or you can have a sort of Christianity that doesn't have anything to do with, with supernatural beliefs at all. Yeah. Um, you know, that's Zizek. That's the Christian atheism of Zizek. Um, you know, if people thought Jordan Peterson was cool, man, you should fucking check out Zizek. He's right. infinitely cooler. Um, and does a lot of the same shit, but does it better. Right. You know, that's what made Jordan Peterson that debate between the two of them look like an ass because, you know, here's Zizek, like who knows Christianity. He studied Chesterton. Like it's, it's, he just, he's so much more astute and it just made Jordan Peterson look like a fool. Yeah. Um, and I love it. You know, I think that's great, but but yeah, it's there are many ways, you know, to quote, you know, to sort of bring it back to Cornell West. There are many avenues to get to the prophetic fire. Um, the point is to just get it because, right. you know, the prophetic fire is what separates us from from, you know, the, the people who don't care. And it's important to care. It's just important to care about life and to care about what happens to you and what happens to other human beings yeah. and have a sense of of uh, have a sense of proportion about where you fit in all of it. Yeah, that's right. But well, we've been going forever, brother. I know. I probably <laughs> no. That's all right. All right, folks. That's all for now. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie at Hope, uh, some random geek, Justin Clark. Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a substack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I would like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. <laughs>